I uh, happened upon this. I don't know how it came up. But it was a short video on YouTube. And I looked at it, and I could not believe what I was seeing. There was a whole, whole video presentation about it, and, um, and how, how it got there, and what caused it, and, and, and why and how it was a blowfish. And let me go to this picture here. Um, that's actually a better nest this is a blowfish nest and this one is not as good as this one and there's a reason for that um, and of course you know you've got to you've got to just cut out all the evolution garbage that they throw on you and because to me this does not prove evolution and it does not support evolution in fact it denies Evolution. The whole basis of evolution is called natural selection. That was Darwin's idea. That has been the, the cattle call of every evolutionary theorist that has ever been since Charles Darwin. They have always said it is the, these, these, all of the creatures on the earth, including us, are here as a result of natural selection. That, um, that a species changed its own DNA in order to better its chances of surviving and better its chances of reproducing and, and thriving on this planet. Now, this has to go on simultaneously, exactly simultaneously with the evolution of plants, flowers, and vegetation. Because there are, we know that there are some creatures whose sole diet is a vegetarian diet. They only eat leaves, grass, fruit, things like that, um, nuts, and so on. But then there's the animal part. Fish fall under that, and the idea is that there are some fish that need the vegetation, and there are some fish and some creatures that need other creatures to feed on, or they're omnivorous, which means they eat both flesh and they eat both uh, vegetation. Okay, so, and what you have to have is, you have to have a system whereby everything that is on this earth right now, every form of life, every species of life, and there are thousands of them. And I don't mean like a hundred different breeds of dog. I'm talking, there are thousands and thousands of different species of animals and vegetation on this earth and in order for one species to be able to thrive, what has to thrive simultaneously with that species of animal is vegetation has to thrive at the same time. Because if you cut out the vegetation and the, ve and the plants and the flowers and the grains and the seeds and the leaves and everything else doesn't do well on the earth, then what does the lower life forms feed on? They can't thrive. They can't reproduce themselves, and they die. Uh, I'm not even going to get into the DNA argument this morning, but basically all of this happens as a result of changes that they say takes place in the DNA of each and every single species. And again, all of the species' DNA, it all has to remain balanced over the 500 million years that they say life has been on this earth. 500 million years. That, that is Darwin's uh, magic wand, as it were. All you need to do is wait 500 million years. Okay? So, here's the analogy. If I wanted, let's say, Chris, I wanted you to take a box of Scrabble. You know what Scrabble is, the game? Take all the letters, shake them up real good, and I want you to dump them down on the table. What I'm looking for is just two lines out of Shakespeare. Um, to be or not to be, that is the question. That's what I'm looking for. So Chris comes in, dumps out the Scrabble letters, and all you, you, some of them are upside down, some of them are right side up, some of them are sitting on top of one another, and it's just a mess, isn't it? I don't think anybody has ever taken Scrabble letters and dumped them out, and all the words they need are right there. 
I win. Okay. Um, doesn't work that way. So I say, Chris, where's my, where's my Shakespeare? To be or not to be, that is the question. Chris says, just wait. Just wait. So I come back a year. Chris, where is it? Just, I'm telling you, wait. 500 million years later, according to Chris's theory, to be or not to be would be written on that table. Okay? That's, that's what evolution believes. Or for us to take the genome of humans, human beings, we have billions and billions of co different combinations of amino acids that make the letters that make the book of our DNA. The comparison is to take a typewriter and 500 million sheets of paper and throw it out to the front yard of this church and evolution says in due time it will type out by itself the the A's, the C's, the G's, and the T's of DNA, of the DNA code. It will type out a perfect rendering of the human genome in 500 years. Now, what's, what's the number one problem with that? Just they take that analogy of the paper and the typewriter sitting out in the front yard of the church. If you come back in five years, Sterling, what are you going to see out in the front yard of the church? A, a mess. Okay? It'll be a mess. What will happen to the paper? It will deteriorate. Sun, the sun would beat down on it. The rain would, would weaken the pulp of the paper. That's called the law of entropy. Is that everything tends to get worse in this universe, not better. Nothing, you never buy a new car and in five years it's newer. And smells better. Amen? And there are no french fries in the seat. Amen? Yeah, or quarters. You know what quarters are to a college student? Gas money. I've paid for gas and quarters before. Anyway, here's, here's, all right. Natural selection says that this breed of fish, and how many breeds of fish are there in the oceans of the world? Just thousands in and of itself, Okay. Uh, there, there are species of fish that we don't even know exist that are probably down in the uh, Marianas Trench or someplace. So anyway, you have this one species of fish, the puff, puffer fish. By the way, how does a puffer fish keep from being eaten? They're poisonous. Now they puff, one. Some of them have spikes coming out, but mainly they're poison. And it's a real... They eat them, they eat them a lot in Japan. But anyway... So you have this puffer fish. This is a male puffer fish. And the male puffer fish is the one charged to building this nest. Now look at the symmetry of this nest. I mean, just to ask a fish to draw a perfect circle in the sand with its bottom fin, that's how it does a lot of this stuff. It's got one fin on the bottom that it uses, it'll, it'll go just barely above the sand surface and it'll carve out what you see in the middle of this. It'll carve those little dredge lines there that, that are a decoration. It's meant to be pretty to the female puffer fish. Because if the female, female puffer fish sees that and then she sees, you know, if this is Jim's nest over here and here's Bubba's nest over here, she's going to select Bubba. Bubba's the one that gets to have his children's line passed down to multiple generations. Old Jim here, he gets nothing. Because female fish looks at it and says, nah, that ain't enough. But just to get a fish to draw a perfect circle in the sand, and not only do that, maintain it. Because ocean currents, they, there's one video I saw actually showed the puffer fish will swim around in the middle of this nest area waiting for a female and the motions of his body are there to push the ocean currents out of this nest so it doesn't disturb his design. He is literally tasked with changing the current of the ocean. Isn't that something? 
so it doesn't mess up his divine he, uh, design. He worked hard on this. Now, again, we're supposed to believe that 500 million years did this change to whatever species the puffer fish came from 500 million years ago. We're supposed to believe that they developed this in their own bodies by them completely by themselves with no exterior help whatsoever and yet now our scientists our biologists with CRISPR and the, the, the ability to change DNA very quickly our own scientists come out each one of them are looking for a, a Nobel Prize and they're looking for grant money and they're looking for um, big uh, pharmaceutical company contracts and they're looking for licensing uh, right now one of the biggest money makers in human medicine is gene alteration because we've gotten to a point where we can do it very cheaply very easily and then once your company comes up with a stable change in the human genome they can go and patent it at the US patent office and license that so that if another lab wants to use your method or your genome, they have to pay you to be able to use it. Okay? So this is big money here. And so all of our scientists today go around, pat themselves on the back, and they get big rewards for doing, uh, for doing something like this. And we're supposed to believe that nature did, did this all by itself without any intervention from anything whatsoever because amongst those who teach and preach evolution you cannot you cannot have anything that leans toward there was a creator or a designer you cannot say that you will lose your tenure at the university you will lose your scholarships you'll lose your uh your grant money nobody will take you seriously ever again in the human genome circles and the and the intelligent circles that these evolutionary scientists uh, go in they make sure that every theory that makes it out of some lab somewhere always points in the direction of natural selection versus intelligent design and again we're supposed to believe that the puffer not the puffer fish's brain the puffer fish's DNA decided to start making circles in the sand 400, 500, 100 million years ago. And that 10 million years later, because of an accident and one fish, I don't know, maybe they were drunk or they were out of their head or whatever, they decided to add flair to it. I, I didn't think I'd ever wear a paisley tie ever again. And I got one on today. It's really, I like it. But I used to wear them real loud paisley ties. You remember those? Yeah. Okay. So that one, one puffer fish, you know, 100 million years ago decided he added some flair to his. And another puffer fish saw that and he's going, he saw he's the female puffer fish going to that nest. And he's going, wait a minute, I need to do that. And we're supposed to believe that happens. And I don't. And I never will. Everything to me points to the fact that there's a creator. Just the fact that a fish can draw a perfect circle with its bottom fin is amazing enough. But then when I saw that, I literally went, and I was shaking my head like, I can't believe this. There's no way. When I looked upon that and I just saw how perfect it was, the symmetry of it, the shape of the circle, it's not an oval, it's a perfect circle. And that fish, that puffer fish, that male, will, will maintain that nest until the female decides to plant her eggs right in the middle of that nest. And that means I've selected you and your nest. And here's the eggs. You do your business. And then we'll have, we'll have a lot of little puffer fishes coming up. And I don't know how, how long. But that's what we're supposed to believe is that that happens all by accident. I just don't buy, I don't buy it. I don't, I don't even buy it if God started the process 13.8 billion years ago and just let everything go. I, I don't buy that one either. Um, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. 
and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. The, the bottom of the ocean was without form and void until a male pufferfish came along, and God had put inside the mind of that pufferfish how to draw. Uh, and by the way, the, the rays that are coming out of the center, they do that. They'll, they'll go to the center, and when they get to a, this, let me get my pen here. I'm pointing to my screen, and you're going, I can't see what you're doing. When, when the puffer fish gets to here, see, see my circle? I did good. Uh, when it gets to this point here, it starts f flapping its side fins and using hydraulics, the, the, the force of water to move sand. And here's the best part. It goes around picking up little pieces of seashells. You know how they're shiny on one side? That puffer fish will go around, and number one, he'll clean out the center area. Guys, listen to that. You want to make your wife happy? Clean something. <laughs> Amen? Thank you. Uh, he'll keep, he'll, that, the center part of that would be spotless. And any pieces of shell that he sees laying around, he'll decorate these areas here. Every one of these ridges on the exterior right here, you can see some of them like right there. They all get decorated with jewels. Little jewels, little diamonds that he finds in the bottom of the ocean floor the pieces of shell that he finds, he will decorate it with, he will ornament it with jewels. The way God said he decorated Jerusalem in Ezekiel chapter 16. Okay? I love it. I love it. I, I thought, man, I've got to talk about this. And uh, I've got, I'm working on adding a bunch more to things like this. I'm going to start making some little short videos called Creation Bites. And I'm going to just, things that I find out about nature and about this world and about things like this. And when I see things like this, I am more convinced that there was a God that created this puffer fish to do exactly that. Yes, Gary. Uh-oh. Uh, Jesus said that he would decorate Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm telling you. Uh, God decorated the night sky, didn't he? with jewels, little diamonds in the sky. See, God did that. To think that God is some bland God that only makes things in straight lines and everything's black or white, uh, you don't understand God. God is the one who created this whole universe and when you see the beauty that exists, not just in this world, but in other worlds as well, and all the stars and the alignments thereof and the, the, the eclipse that we saw a couple weeks ago. When you see things like that, when you see a sunset, God paints a pretty picture. Does better than any artist on this earth. And um, it just it, it amazes me of the, the, what was the word they used in this video? Uh, I can't remember. That's why I have, I have to take notes on everything. But anyway, just the, the design of this tells me that I know that in this world right now, something like this to appear on the bottom of the ocean floor is not accidental. It doesn't just happen. I know that somebody might have done this deliberately. Well, now I found out that it was a puffer fish who's got a brain about this big. And yet, with that brain, he can draw multiple perfect circles in the sand, perfectly aligned with one another. All right, now let's move on. Revelation 10. You were supposed to tell me, uh-huh, I was sick last Sunday, so you thought, well, he'll forget. You were supposed to tell me what you think the seven thunders might be. Revelation 10, verse 3. The angel, who's got the book in his hand, he's got a rainbow over his head, his face is shining like the sun, his feet are as pillars of brass, he's clothed with a cloud, 
and he has a, a little book open in his hand. And with this, he cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth. We studied that. Uh, I don't know if we covered everything, but uh, I think it would be okay if we skip over a couple things. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. Now let me just ask you, this kind of goes, on, this kind of goes along with the puffer fish question. Is that the first time and the only time you see the number seven mentioned in the book of Revelation? No. You got the seven seals. Well, you have the seven churches. You want to get technical about it. It starts out with the seven churches. The seven candles. Okay? Uh, which are the seven spirits of God. Uh, and then you have the seven seals. And then you have the seven trumpets, which is what we're in now. And then you have the uh, seven vials of wrath. Uh, that's poured out on the earth and so on. Now, is that the only place in the Bible that you see a significant use of the number seven? No, of course not. You have the seven days in a week. And who instituted that? Did man institute that or did God do that? God did that. God is the one who gave us seven days in a week. Um, there was a man, a French atheist by the name of Voltaire. Not Voltron. Okay, that's for our, who, where is Voltron in the, help me out here. It's a kid's cartoon. Huh? Defender of the universe? Okay, all right, I knew it was in one of those. He-Man or something like that. Anyway, Voltaire said that he, he said this like in 1780. I absolutely believe with all my heart, and I think it'll be proven that within a hundred years, Christianity will be eradicated from this earth. Well, it wasn't. And, um, yeah. Uh, nobody, if I were to say, hey, did you ever hear of Voltaire? People have, have never heard of Voltaire. Have you ever heard of Jesus? Oh, yeah. Everybody's heard of Jesus, haven't they? They may not know much about him, but they've heard him. Christianity has not been driven off the face of the earth. In fact, it thrived after that. But anyway, so you have the use of seven in other places in the Bible. Uh, the priest with uh, the blood sprinkling the ark seven times. Other significant uses of the number seven. The feast of unleavened bread was seven days. The feast of, of weeks was based upon the, the math of seven weeks with seven days in them. That's 49 days, seven times seven. And then you had the uh, Jubilee on the 50th, uh, day, 50th week or whatever. You had the day of Pentecost. And then you have the, um, the Feast of Tabernacles. That lasts seven days. So you have the number seven just used significantly all throughout the Bible. And with the Bible, you don't have just one author that is writing everything down from Genesis to Revelation. I didn't know this, but there is significant doubt as to even the words of Shakespeare. George, they don't even know that they have the plays of William Shakespeare accurately that would match what he wrote with his own pen back in this... 1500s, 1600s. I didn't know that. That the, the writings of Shakespeare were in doubt. And even to this day, some of them still are in doubt. They don't know if Shakespeare really said it. And yet you have a Bible that we go back to the days of Abraham and Job, who lived about the time of Abraham. That was 2,000 years before Christ. You have 2,000 years to Christ. You have 2,000 more years from Christ to us. So we have a span of 4,000 years in which the word of God was given to us in a complete form, written not by the same author, but written by 40 different authors who lived in different locations, who lived at different times, who had different backgrounds, 
One person who wrote the Bible was a fisherman. One person who wrote the Bible was a tax collector. One person, one prophet who wrote the Bible was in prison when he wrote it. Paul was in prison when he wrote some of his letters. We know the letter, the last letter to Timothy, he was in prison. Uh, Moses was uh, educated in all the languages and knowledge of Egypt until he was 40 years old. And do you know what people, you know what scholars said about Moses writing the first five books of the Bible? They said it absolutely didn't have, now this is going back probably 50, 80, 100 years ago. There's no way that Moses wrote anything in the Bible because we know that writing did not even show up until many years after Moses. And then they found a big rock called a stell, S-T-E-L-L-E. And on it was called the Law of Hammurabi. And it was a, Hammurabi was this sort of like a god king uh, over the Sumerian people or the Assyrian people or somebody like that. And his law was codified and written down in stone on this big stone and, it's, and we know for a fact that it came before Moses did. So science predicted that Moses couldn't have writ, written the Old Testament because writing didn't exist, and then they found writing that existed before Moses. So can anybody say that anymore? No. Once again, the Bible's proven right, and the people who hate God and who hate the Bible and who hate religion... They always want to tell you, no, it's not possible, it's not possible, it's not possible. But I think it is. Amen? Now, what... Oh. That's a little early. Do what? Sure. <laughs> That's my point. But see, they, I, what, here's what I learned in Bible college. Most of the scholars, especially the, the European ones, German ones in particular, German theologians were notorious for coming up with everything that's wrong with the Bible. And, we, you know, there was always amongst the scholars a debate about who wrote what in the Bible. And if it says the first book of Moses, the, then you would have scholars that would say, Moses never wrote a book. So therefore... This cannot be Moses' words. It cannot be Moses' writing. Moses didn't write a book. Then they found out that writing existed before Moses. So, okay, Moses could have written a book. But we don't think he did write a book. They're still not changing their mind. Because they don't. And um, anyway, I just felt like sharing, uplifting your faith today. And give you another week to tell me what the 730. Who thinks they know what they are? Do what? It is. You're right on that. It is the voice of God. And here's my thing. And that I, I sat one day and I thought this out. I said, you know, if this is going to be the voice of God and this is the word of God, then probably it would have to be in the Bible somewhere. Because I don't believe that God speaks outside of the word of God. All scriptures given by inspiration of God and that the man of God may be perfect and thoroughly furnished into all good works. So if it's the voice of God and the words of God, it must be in the Bible. So that, when I reached that part, I thought, well, but John didn't write it. How many books did John write? Does anybody know? Five? Hi, Mr. Hand. Hi, everybody. Five books. Okay. Gospel of John, three letters, and the book of Revelation. And um, where was it going with that? That was, anyway, I guess it's time to pray now. But anyway, John, you won't find what I think the seven thunders might be. You won't find them in any of the writings of John. But they are written other places. Does that make sense? John didn't write it. But I think somebody else did. We'll find out. Heavenly Father, we love you. And we thank you, Lord, for the puffer fish. And the thing that we just learned today. And God, there's just no way that seeing that and hearing what I listened to the other night, 
it does not tell me that you don't exist. It tells me that you must exist and that you absolutely have to be the creator of everything that is in this universe uh, or it wouldn't be here because there is nothing big enough, nothing powerful enough, nothing wise enough in this world or in heaven that could compare to your wisdom and that is wise enough and smart enough and strong enough to do the things that we see done in nature. Father, we just thank you, God, for your word. We thank you, God, for the faith that you've blessed us with. And Father, may we carry that faith on uh, throughout our lives. Help us to pass it down to our children and our children's children unto the fourth generation. Bless this Sunday school time, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen.